Well, good morning. I'm Nemanja Selovich, and I'll be presenting computer architectural work done by our team at UC Berkeley on what we call running a quantum circuit at the speed of data. So here's a very simple quantum circuit. It's a logical quantum circuit. So uh, at the very least, we expect it will have to perform a QEC step after each logical gate. Now, if we're using a Steen-style uh, quantum error correction like the CSS codes, each of those QEC steps breaks down into a rather lengthy and complex zero, relatively speaking, encoded zero and silver pair, followed by a much shorter involvement with the data itself. So if we go ahead and just run the circuit like that, we have some latency. However, those zero and silver pairs, besides being identical, are also truly independent of the data. They can be taken off to the side and done a bit in advance. And uh, so now what we get is as soon as the first one's done, we can perform the data involved portion of the first QEC step, the logical C0, and then immediately only the data involved portions of the other QEC steps, giving us a much shorter overall latency. Now, of course, we're not just chasing latency for latency's sake. Uh, what this also translates into is shorter qubit lifetimes, much less time in memory, and therefore less memory decoherence. Just overall, everyone wins if we, if we can actually keep our data alive for a shorter time and still get the same results. Now, in addition to quantum error correction, non-transversal logical gates exhibit a uh, similar property in that you can perform this somewhat complex preparation of uh, an encoded ancilla qubit into some state and then at the very end have some little involvement with the data and get an overall result of the application of a non-transversal gate. So putting these two together, we get what we call the speed of data. Essentially, those colored boxes are the end, are the uh, data involved portions of various quantum operations. Time goes from left to right and each row corresponds to some logical operation. So the light blue box, the first one is some transversal logical gate, no preparation necessary. Then uh, QEC step where the zero and is prepared in advance, there's a data involved portion and so on. And so we can run the circuit much, much faster and our data needs to survive a much, long, a much shorter time overall. This is nice. But of course, if we take a look at one moment in time there, a vertical line, all those ancilla preps that are happening are happening in parallel, and that means that each one needs separate hardware. So the more parallelism you have, the more hardware you have, and the bigger layout you have. So we have this time hardware trade-off. Let's take a closer look at this time hardware trade-off. We took a realistic circuit, a 32-bit quantum carry look-ahead adder. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a quantum circuit that adds two 32-bit numbers. In order to get some latency estimates, we've, uh, we had to choose a technology. We've been working with ion traps. And the idea is we imagine a magical box, a generator, which outputs encoded zero ancilla at some constant rate. They are consumed as the logical circuit is running, the useful circuit, they're consumed for quantum error correction by the most critical data first. And what we do is on the x-axis, we vary the rate at which these encoded zero ancilla are provided. On the y-axis, we look at the uh, uh, latency of the overall circuit. And we see past a certain point on the right word, data gets all the ancilla it needs, so increasing the bandwidth doesn't buy us anything, that's why it asymptotes. But as we start throttling the provided encoded zero ancilla, the latency starts skyrocketing. So from an architectural perspective, this tells us we want to focus on making certain that we can provide encoded ancilla fast enough that we don't start getting orders of magnitude higher latency. So we focus on these ancilla factories, which you also may have heard Dan Gottesman mention on the first day. They're specific hardware designed and dedicated to churning out and encoded ancilla at a regular rate. To this end, we have something we call the Calypso architecture, which we're working on. Uh, it uh, in involved, now first I'm going to introduce the idealized Calypso architecture. It involves all the encoded data in the entire system packed into a small region as possible, but still allowing local communication, whether that's ballistic movement, swapping, or whatever else. The data is just packed in tightly so they're close together. They are surrounded by a whole bunch of ancilla factories that are churning out encoded zero and encoded non-transversal ancilla for use by the data. And there's full multiplexing, which means any ancilla generated at any factory can go to any data. Ideally, if we match the bandwidth of need with bandwidth of production, we get full utilization of the system, which would be a good thing. That's low waste. Since we're designing the ancilla factories anyway, let's go ahead and design them to have output ports physically close to the data, so once we have our good encoded ancilla, they don't have to move too far, low movement decoherence. Meanwhile, the input ports of an ancilla factory, if you think about it, are just junk qubits. They have irrelevant or undefined state, so they can go ahead and be far away from the data. To illustrate this, look at that uh, middle left ancilla factory right there. It generates an encoded zero ancilla. 
that ancilla only needs to move a short distance into the data, performs whatever wackiness it was intended for in there, and ends up as just a set of irrelevant or stateless qubits. And those can be moved a much further distance since we don't care about decohering their state. So with this general architectural design, our goals now will be first to lay out some ancilla factories and get area and bandwidth estimates, and second to answer this specific question, if we want to run at the speed of data, not slow down data by anything that's non-critical, what hardware resources are we talking about, relatively speaking? A bit about our methodology. We have a tool set we're working on and continuing to work on. Uh, it's intended for the computer-aided design, it's CAD, of quantum circuits. And essentially, it allows us to lay out, to schedule, and to evaluate circuits, both in terms of latency, area, um, error analysis, whatever we want. In order to do layouts, we needed to uh, assume a technology. And as I said, we're working on ion traps. We also assume local gates. So two qubits have to come together in order to perform an operation. And since uh, electrode configuration Configurations are changing all the time. Those are in flux uh, as experiments are being done. We needed some kind of abstraction for our layouts. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's a picture of an actual experimental T-junction and ion trap. We look at that and we say that's a three-way intersection. So we've selected this set of basic blocks. Assuming 90 degree angles, we can now go ahead and create layouts with these four sets of basic blocks. And in addition, since we want to actually be able to perform computation, um, we need places where that can be done. Since uh, lasers are expensive and uh, ion traps perform computation using lasers, we have certain dedicated locations where lasers are focused. We assume they can't be done in intersections. So this is how gate locations are identified as black squares. Now, as a uh, picture is worth a thousand words, an animation is worth a thousand pictures, or at least a few dozen a second. So here is a sample layout we could generate. The white channels are for qubit movement. The yellow circles are qubits. You can see each qubit seems to have a black halo around it. That's actually a gate location. So that's the black square. Each qubit starts in a valid gate location. Once it moves out, you'll see the black square stays there. And when uh, the qubits turn blue, that means they're being operated upon. So now we have some circuit we're executing on this layout. And a lot of the qubits are operating, and now the real fun starts. So the main part is in scheduling qubit movement in order to allow two qubit operations. So this is just a demonstration. The actual circuit isn't important, but this uh, tool set allows us to lay things out, to test out schedules, and to do error analysis based on uh, realistic movements, things like that. So now back to the topic at hand which is the creation of ancilla factories. Now using this tool set, we can go ahead and start creating ancilla factories. So for instance, let's take the level 1713 code. I'll run through uh, an example right now. Uh, we assume that a data qubit is error corrected, is bit corrected and then phase corrected by two separate encoded zero ancilla. Now those two zero ancilla circuits are identical and we've evaluated a few circuits and I know this conference has seen many, many more. For this example, I'll go ahead and use this particular circuit. We uh, encode three logical zeros. We create three three qubit cat states. Verify each logical zero by one cat state. Assuming the verification succeeded, the middle logical zero is bit corrected and phase corrected by the other two. That output is used to correct the data, to bit correct the data and then you need a second output to phase correct the data. Uh, and then finally, the logical zero encoding, we'll go ahead and use this circuit. It's, uh, it involves a few physical zero prepares and Hadamards, and then a set of nine C naughts. I'm actually going to refer to those C naughts again. So those are the C naughts necessary to logically encode a zero. What we really care about in this slide, though, is this circuit in the lower right hand corner. That's our Ancilla factory. So that's a circuit that's going to be run many, many, many times during the execution of virtually any quantum circuit. So we want to design that. I repeat the circuit up there, uh, just for reference. I'm going to run through two designs of an Ancilla factory. The first one is akin to what's been assumed in much of the prior work, and that is essentially you just leave enough room for the, ans for the uh, qubits to do what they need to do. So this particular layout uh, leaves enough room for the seven qubits of the logical zero prepare and the three qubits of a cast state prepare. So there's 10 gate locations, 10 qubits can be placed, channels above and below them so they can move around and communicate communicate, and so we can do the logical zero prepare, the cast state prepare, and the verification right here. Realistically, we need three of these, so we go ahead and put three of them together, and that gets us through all the verifies, and then we can go ahead and bit correct and phase correct in place. So the idea is, you bring in 30 junk qubits, you run through this big circuit, and you recycle 23 of them immediately, seven of them can go ahead and be used for error correction. 
so this is nice. It's a working Ancilla generator, and depending on what kind of bandwidth we want in our factory, we can go ahead and place as many of them as we want to get that bandwidth. However, it also means that Ancilla are being generated all over the factory, and we wanted output ports. So the way it is right now, as the Ancilla are being generated, they're being routed over different distances, suffering different decoherence, and also an architectural problem, there's congestion in there. Actually moving those things around is not so trivial in a plane. So we're going to do, um, in order to get our output ports, we're gonna use a classical technique called pipelining, which involves taking that circuit and breaking it up to stages. So here's our pipeline in Scylla factory. The idea is uh, the first stage has all the physical zero prepares necessary both for the logical zero encode and for the cat states. And we group the Hadamards into that stage. Second stage has the C knots for the logical zero prepare. I referred to them a couple slides ago. And the C knots for the cat prep. Third stage is verification. And fourth stage is bit and phase correct. And I'd like to emphasize now that this is not purely conceptual. The whole point of this is each of those boxes is a piece of hardware. And they are actually laid out in this direction. So what happens is that as a qubit is physically moving through the circuit, it is also, excuse me, as it is moving through the circuit, it is physically moving across the layout. So what we do now is we uh, bandwidth match adjacent stages. The idea there is that if uh, the bandwidth between stages are equal, you keep the pipeline completely full, high utilization again. And because this is sort of a physical layout, we have input and output ports. All our inputs come in over there physically, and outputs come in one relatively concentrated area, which we put close to the data. So this is our pipeline zero and Scylla factory. We went ahead and put it in the tool set, got area and uh, bandwidth estimates. I don't have time to go through the second one, which is for the 713 code pi over eight and negative pi over eight and non-transversal. So we went ahead and designed a pi over eight and Scylla factory, which is larger and more complex, but we follow the same ideas got area and bandwidth estimates for that. We put all that together, and now we can finally attack our question. We took three quantum circuits, or a ripple carry adder, a carry look ahead adder, just two different forms of adders, and a Fourier transform. Those are 32-bit versions of all three circuits. So they're relatively large once you actually uh, encode them into 713. And we ran, we uh, computed what would be necessary uh, to run at the speed of data. At what rate does data actually consume both zero and scylla and non-transversal and scylla. And we put that together with our scylla factories. And so the bottom set of boxes in each circuit is the percentage of the layout area dedicated to data. The middle set of boxes, percentage data area dedicated to zero ancillas necessary for QEC. And the top set of boxes are non-transversal ancilla factories. So we see, first of all, ancilla generation does in fact uh, dominate the layout. And in particular, for the more interesting parallel circuits like that middle carry look ahead adder, it's over 93%. So 93% of the layout is supporting the data, which is doing the computation. Now, um, thus far, this has all been on the idealized Calypso. I want to spend a slide on ongoing work, and that is the practical Calypso. So as you start growing um, the size of the circuit, and particularly once you get up into factorization, and you have thousands of data qubits you're working with, that dense data region is just going to get too large. A local communication might break down, and there will certainly be congestion both from the data and from Ancilla coming in. So realistically, we're going to need multiple data regions, or at least we expect we will. Each one has a few tightly packed data. Each one is surrounded by its own set of Ancilla factories with output ports focused on the Ancilla factories. Uh, not depicted here is that we do need some kind of communication network between the data regions, and you might have gotten some ideas about that in the previous talk or also in Rod Van Meter's talk a couple of days ago. So we're focusing on what happens within one tile. And with the idea of what happens within one tile, these data regions, we basically want to make them as large as possible because we get two big benefits. One, if we assume that local communication is somewhat cheaper than really long distance communication, the larger your data region, the more likely you can keep data within there for a while doing computation. And two, the Ancilla factories are multiplexed only to their own data region, which means if you get this huge imbalance, let's say the rightmost data region is all of a sudden quantum error correcting a lot, those leftmost Ancilla factories are going to waste. We can't get Ancilla, and now you have wasted hardware, and we're already, hardware is already precious on the quantum data path. So we want to get these data regions as large as possible, but of course we're limited by some realities. So in summary, we've taken the approach that we want to do whatever we can to keep data flowing as fast as possible and provide Ancilla um, 
as much as possible whenever the data is ready. To this end, our architectural approach is to design these pieces of hardware, these Ancilla factories, which churn out encoded Ancilla, and by pipelining them, we get this nice additional benefit of having output ports clo physically close to the data. And we've uh, presented and studied this Calypso architecture, and our, uh, the results of our initial layout investigation is that, yes, Ancilla generation does, in fact, dominate area and encourages us to keep trying to better these Ancilla factories, make them more realistic. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor to questions. It's treated exactly the same way as if it were corrupted. So you have to be able to detect the ion. That I don't have an answer for you on how well you can detect it, but if you detect that it's gone, you bring in a junk one and essentially do an error correction step. And you treat it as if it was corrupted. Hopefully that was the only error. So is there a source for, for new ions in this? Uh, uh, not in our design, but that would have to be in there. We haven't added that because we have no accurate uh, statistics on how often that's going to happen, and that'll determine how many sources you need. But yeah, you do need a source for those. So that is something we can simulate in terms of building. Architecture doesn't come into play until you get into at least a few dozen qubits. Uh, as far as I know, Wineland is working on six. And the thing is when you have, or maybe up to a dozen, but the thing is when you have that few, you don't need to organize them. You just want to put them together. So in terms of building, no, we're uh, going a couple of years in advance, hopefully. But there is, the reason that we attack this problem right now is that a lot of these problems have classical counterparts which are nowhere near solved and nowhere near optimal. So it's not just, it's not like we can just take classical analogs. We're doing research that could potentially apply to classical stuff as well. Yeah. Because we couldn't come up with an algorithm and I like Saturn's moons. <laughs> Excuse me, we couldn't come up with an acronym, and I like Saturn's moons. That's what I meant. <laughs>